Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today I'm going to be announcing a new game that has just been announced uh, as of yesterday. Uh, There's uh, a lot of gaming news coming out in the last few weeks, but I wanted to talk about it because it's a, a series that I've covered a fair bit on the channel, not recently, uh, but it, it is really one of sort of my beloved franchises, and that is Rule the Waves. If you're unfamiliar with Rule the Waves, it is a, uh, there's a Rule the Waves 1 and a Rule the Waves 2, and in many ways I imagine it inspired Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts. Rule the Waves is a game where you are sort of the head of a naval bureaucracy, basically the Secretary of the Navy. You design warships, you manage budgets, you build warships and sort of craft your fleet. And there's also a strategic element to it where nations have these tension bars and can result in going to war. When nations go to war, then you fight the battles uh, on a 2D map. It's a little bit more like a spreadsheet game than something like Ultimate Admiral, uh, but it is, you know, really in many ways sort of the beginning of this genre of types of games. Rule the Waves 1 focused on the World War I period starting in 1900. Uh, and I want to say running through to like 1918 or 1920 is kind of where the tech stopped. And then Rule the Waves 2 still started in 1900, but basically went through sort of the World War II period. So it included the addition of aircraft carriers and air combat. Um, I think that part of the game probably has some area for improvement. Uh, hopefully we see that uh, with their upcoming work. Um, but it, it includes aircraft carriers, so that's a thing. Uh, and uh, that was definitely one of the major additions for Roll of Waves 2. Uh, before we jump any further into the video, the footage that you're looking at in front of you is from a Roll of Waves 2 collaboration series I did with XTRG. Um, Tortuga, Ben Magnus, uh, from a few years ago. So this is footage from Rule the Waves 2 um, that I just had on hand that I, you know, didn't want you looking at a black screen or like scrolling through websites or text or whatnot, give you something to look at uh, while I talk about this. Now, Rule the Waves 3 is actually was originally going to be a DLC. It was going to be called Rule the Waves 2 Ironclad to Missile Cruisers. It was going to push the start date forward to 1890, and then I believe get out as far as about 1960. So essentially, it would push things forward far enough so that you could have pre-Dreadnought battleships in all their glory before they get superseded with Dreadnoughts. Because if you think about it, when you start in 1900 and roll the waves, there's always sort of this, all right, I've got my standard starting fleet of pre-Dreadnoughts, but I've only got five or six years to play around with them before they're obsolete. So I'm probably not going to invest a ton of time and effort into building these things. I'll probably just keep my st standard fleet around, make sure we don't end up at war for a few years, and then I'll, I'll jump right into the Dreadnoughts. Well, now by pushing things forward to 1890, you're really looking at a 15-year, 16-year window of sort of the glorious period of dreadnoughts or pre-dreadnoughts. And so there's also new tech that comes with that. Um, you know, you're not so close to steam turbines. There's a lot of stuff with that comes with that. Also, by pushing things out past World War II now, you're introducing, as the title would suggest, missile cruisers. So you're sort of in the early phases of surface-to-surface anti-ship missiles. You, you already have aircraft that are involved in Rule the Waves 2, but now you also look at sort of the transition to jet-powered aircraft. So there's an evolu evolution in aircraft design that will also have to take place in the game. So it was really going to be a very ambitious and large expansion, and they made the the developers made the decision to say, rather than making this a DLC for Rule the Waves 2, we're going to go ahead and just make it a standalone sequel and call it Rule the Waves 3. Now, I can only sort of guess at why they made this decision, but I imagine a big part of it is the fact that Christopher Dean who was the business owner, I guess, or the owner of uh, Naval Warfare Simulations, passed away last year. If you're not familiar with Rule the Waves, and if you're not familiar with Naval Warfare Simulation, there's a reason for that. It's because Naval Warfare Simulation is a standalone website where you can buy games like Rule the Waves that are developed by NWS, Naval Warfare Simulations. Um, it's a small shop. I think there, there were like three guys involved, but Christopher Dean was sort of the, the business side of things. Uh, and then I think Frederick was sort of the head programmer. Um, and, uh, and there's another, another guy, I think William Miller. 
uh, who I believe is kind of like, a, I don't know if he's a project manager or whatnot, but I think he's kind of the business guy now. And essentially with Christopher passing away, there's some really weird like post on the Naval Warfare site about like if you have claims against the estate of Christopher Dean, you know, to contact the court to, to make your claim. I think that's because for a brief period of time after Christopher passed away, there were purchases that were being made that were not like able to be actionable because the game actually uses like a form of DRM that they manage through their site and you have to get like keys and codes activated. Um, it was, you know, I, I really love rule the waves, but it was kind of a, a, a time gone by way of doing business. It's not something that you see a lot of companies do anymore. You don't see a lot of game developers sell on their own websites, certainly not without being somewhere else. You don't see a ton of these like key based DRM schemes unless they're integrated with something like steam, uh, where there's like, you know, an email that you get the key in and then it's like managed by an individual. So I imagine there was some stuff going there that, you know, resulted in some folks probably being out of some money. And that's why there's this really strange legal notice on the, on the forums. Um, they've since set up a new sort a store or the storefront, the ability to, um, purchase the game exists again, uh, and other games, uh, but, um, yeah, so th that's, I think, maybe one reason they made the decision to go to Rule the Waves 3. And I'm wondering if the reason there's that, like, court commentary as well is perhaps, like, I, th I think, and again, this is all speculation, but um, if you're making claims against Christopher Dean's estate for purchases that you made that weren't fulfilled, that, and I'm not a lawyer by any means, so preface this with that, but that almost implies to me that maybe the website was set up in Christopher's name and not in like a, a formally registered business, which a lot of small businesses are set up individually and not as, as registered businesses. So that's not that surprising. But if, if NWS was set up as Christopher Dean's like private business in his own name, you know, I, I don't know what that means in terms of like, Obviously, they figured it out because they're selling games again, but it might just, you know, remove a barrier just to go to Steam directly rather than managing their own site for new games. Presumably, since, you know, Rule the Waves 3 is going to sell a bunch more copies than any of their existing games, which tend to skew on a, on a pretty older scale. And the reason I say that, because I haven't really gotten to the reason yet, is they also made a big announcement. Rule the Waves 3 will be sold on Steam. So again, all of this speculation around what might have been going on in terms of the site and whatnot. Um, you know, I don't know. That's all speculation. But the fact that they're going to Steam is something they said in the past they wouldn't do um, for various reasons. But they have decided they're going to Steam now and they're going to go to Steam with Rule the Waves 3 and it's going to be a standalone expansion. So that's pretty exciting. Maybe some more folks will be introduced to Rule the Waves and, and find it a really interesting concept. Um, you know, there's a lot of new features that they've announced uh, for Rule the Waves 3, or I guess uh, it was in this document that they posted on their forum, which I'll link uh, for the Rule the Waves uh, Missile Age uh, uh, catalog, if you will. Uh, but essentially, there's uh, several new features that I'm particularly excited about. One, there's going to be more AI nations. So I think right now it's like five nations in a game, and one of them is the player. Um, there's going to be up to eight AI nations playing. They're introducing the ability for AI nations to go to war against each other. So that's not something that was possible in the past. You could have wars where, al where your ally AI nation would be fighting with you against an AI, but there was never like an AI versus AI war. So that's going to be new. They're adding a new sea region to the game, the Baltic region. Uh, that'll give Russia like a home before it was just sort of North, North Atlantic or whatnot. Um, and it was kind of like off to the side and, and Russia was kind of like, uh, you know, just forgotten. I mean, it was there, but like they didn't have their own dedicated sea region. I'm curious to see how like a dedicated Baltic region might be slightly different. Uh, apparently damage control is getting an overhaul. You can actually like train crews on damage control. So in the previous versions of Rule the Waves, you could train crews on gunnery, on torpedoes. Um, and I'm trying to think of the, the third thing. Uh, but essentially, you could you, you had a couple of different categories you could train your crews on. Uh, you can now uh, do damage control, um, 
you know, national training and damage control uh, bases are getting more complex and more expensive. Uh, so there's some overhaul there to how, how the upkeep works. Uh, more delays to moving ships around strategically, specifically because they're moving this out to the early 18 or late 1800s. They're looking at having delays between when you initi- issue an order to a ship on a foreign station and when that ship actually will move. And the logic there is like until the early 1900s, very few ships, if any, had had wireless technology on the ships like you didn't have a radio you didn't have any kind of ability to communicate to a ship once it left sight with the shore you had to send essentially a courier ship to race out to the fleet at sea to let them know if there were any changes in their orders now as you got toward the dreadnought era or the late pre-dreadnought era that began to change where large warships would have wireless on them so you could communicate with them directly but that was not the case in the early era in the late 1800s and so there's going to be some interesting delays there i think the most exciting changes though for ruled waves three uh, and, and these are pretty big they're adding commanders so naval officers to the game so like right now ruled waves doesn't have any officers on your ship like the crew is is in many ways just sort of like aggregated they have an experience level but there's no concept of an individual commander or an individual officer Um, and so you will actually be giving each ship above the size of a destroyer will have a captain i'm assuming a named captain and then so that is new Uh, And officers, I believe, can be assigned to ships. They can be reassigned. They can be sacked. They can retire as they get older. Um, You know, they can experience old age. They can die in battle. They can be rescued if their ship is sinking. Um, They can become experts at different types of uh, things like maneuver, engineering, rate of fire. So, like, they'll have specialties. I believe I saw on the forums that you can also assign them to, uh, to like, shore-based duties as well. I don't know exactly what that would be. Maybe that's just getting them out of the way and they're being sacked, or maybe it's, like, actually doing something. Um, so that's going to be a pretty big change, perhaps, to how individual ships fight. Additionally, they're adding divisions, which this is very exciting. So previously, Rule the Waves, one of the biggest, I would say, complaints was you had no control over your order of battle. You would design your fleet, you would build your ships, you would manage those ships uh, in like a, in a fleet sense. But there was no ability to say, like, I'm going to group these four ships together into a division of battleships, or I'm going to group these six destroyers together as a destroyer division. When you would enter a battle, the game would just sort of like automatically select, here's the ships that were in this sea region, and here's the ships in that sea region that the a- that the game has just decided are fighting in this battle. And there are ways you could influence that, right? A ship could be on a raiding mission, which would influence, you know, what would happen. Uh, you could be in a different sea region, which obviously you're not going to have ships from a different region fighting in a, in a battle in, in another region. You could have ships set to mothball or reserve so there are things you could do that would like pull them out of the potential of being included in the battle but like if they were at sea or if they were on mission in that sea region the game just randomly decides here's the ships that are involved in this in this particular fight now you have the ability to choose what ships are in which divisions so you can basically make a battleship division make a cruiser division and you decide which ships are in each division. So I'm assuming if there's a grouping of ships together and a battle occurs, that grouping of ships will come into the game. The game already previously auto-generated divisions and battles, but now you'll control which which divisions those ships are consist of. Uh, and I'm imagining there's still a lot of randomness around like how a game decides how large a battle is, how many ships are involved, but I would assume that you at least won't have like quite the free for all of ships uh, generating into battles. So that's exciting. Um, there's a lot of different features about divisions. It sounds like each division has uh, is, is unique. Apparently, according to this document, divisions will form their own personality, nurtured in training, but forged in battle. Obviously, that's a little bit of marketing speak. Um, 
divisions get their own commanders. So I mentioned that ships have commanders, divisions have commanders. So uh, presumably there's, you know, maybe you've got captains. I'm imagining these are like admirals or whatnot, um, and that'll influence their performance. You don't have to create divisions. It is voluntary, so the game can still auto-generate them for you if you want. Uh, divisions may be altered slightly by the battle generator before entering battle, depending on the number of ships assigned to the battle and the type of mission. Um, there's no requirement that all ships in a division be operational or even in the same region. So I'm curious how that'll work. You know, it'll be really frustrating if you're making divisions and, and they're never reflected in battle. But I can understand certain circumstances where like maybe a ship's being refit or a ship is in port or something like that. And not all of the ships in a given division end up in a fight. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, apparently there's updates to the AI. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but aircraft will evolve over time. So, uh, they look at like different types of aircraft and, uh, you've got attack jets, heavy jet fighters, light jet fighters. And you've kind of got like, they've got some icons here of like, uh, you know, a 1950s looking like saber type jet, or this thing almost looks like a frog foot. And then they've got um, like a phantom for the 60s jet. You can see like some of the icons look like they, the evolution between the A4 Skyhawk to the uh, A6 Intruder and whatnot. Um, there's special types of squadrons for different types of roles. Uh, they're introducing helicopters. So that's going to be a change. I'm curious if there's any changes to submarine warfare. Um, it does look like submarines gain an operational mode in the expansion as submarines can now move between regions. So that's different. Um, the total number of submarines active on patrol in a region will be reduced to account for boats in transit and undergoing refit, making long range submarines quite valuable. So in the past, like, I feel like it was the terror of the coastal submarines. So that'll be an interesting change. So that maybe, um, investing more heavily in larger subs is going to be worth more. Um, ASW ships, uh, both submarines and ASW ships on trade patrol will do their work only in the region in which they're currently located. Missile submarines, so that's a new type of submarine, put an appearance, but no nuclear powered, uh, no nuclear power or weapons are included in the game. Kind of makes sense. I, I believe it ends in 1960-ish, so you're kind of in the golden age of the end of the uh, of the diesel powered submarine, but not yet to the full rise of nuclear uh, nuclear subs. Looks like they're making an overhaul to destroyers. ASW is going to have considerable changes. Um, they're going to have air to surface missiles, SAM batteries, both heavy, medium, and light. Heavy surface to surface, medium and light. Um, air to air missiles are a new weapon. Previously, they didn't have that. Um, they're going to have enhancements to the superstructure editor. Uh, so you can make like angled flight decks for your carriers and things like that. Um, you can have, uh, I think this is pretty interesting. I'll include this this image here from from this document about the about the um, about the the superstructure editor. I think that's cool. And again, I'm going to link you to this document where they talk about all this stuff. Um, this document may come out of date. They're still adding new features and new capabilities. They mentioned that as well. Uh, but I'm pretty darn excited. I mean, I was excited about the expansion to begin with, but I guess the fact that they're making it a standalone game and that they're going to be putting it on steam, uh, I think only good things can come of that for them. You know, this isn't, this isn't a flashy game. It's not a big graphics game, so I'm sure it'll still remain somewhat niche. Uh, but like when you're off on your own website, that's kind of, you know, at least they rebuilt the website in, in the last few years. But even before that, you know, when you're off on a website that, you know, no one's ever heard of before, a lot of people only buy their games on Steam. They only buy their games maybe through Epic um, or at least, you know, GOG or Steam or Epic are like the places people buy games. People don't buy a ton of games through individual websites. Some folks still buy through places like Matrix Games or Slytherin, but even Matrix and Slytherin, they have a, they have a or, or like directly through Paradox. Any of those companies have a. Um, a presence on Steam. And so that kind of adds a sense of legitimacy. If you go to a place like Naval Warfare Simulation, it might look like a website that hasn't been touched in a few years. It might not look, you know, like something you're going to want to give some your credit card to. Like, I'm not saying I did it. You know, I bought the original Roll the Waves. Uh, but I still think it's one of those things where, um, you know, it, you're limited, highly limited in terms of your exposure. The only way anyone's ever going to find out about you, because there's just realistically search engine optimization, you're not going to find a lot of people through like Google search. Um, and people, I don't think people find games by just like Google searching random topics and then like, oh, a website, oh, a game exists. Like you get a handful of sales like that. So I think, you know, by going to Steam, um, they're going to expand their reach, hopefully, 
Um, and, uh, and we'll see, I, I hope it's successful. I'm really excited about the officers. I'm excited about the divisions. Um, and a lot of these other features I think will be nice additions. It'll be interesting to see how the battle generator is updated or enhanced if at all. Um, you know, it's, it, it could, I think that's one of the main weaknesses of the game is just how randomized everything is. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, uh, how that evolves. Um, but in any event, um, we are going to see a rule the waves three and it is the previously announced expansion. I guess they've been working on this for like two and a half years. So this is something they, they, I think probably they're like, we should add missiles and we should push forward an earlier start date. Cause a lot of folks have been asking for this. And then it kind of, they kind of made it sound like we sort of realized like over those two and a half years, we kept adding more and more features and it kept getting bigger and bigger. And like, it, this makes sense for it to be a standalone game now, I think. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Leave your thoughts down below in the comments um, and uh, let me know your thoughts. Are you excited for Rule the Waves 3? Or are you excited for Rule the Waves on Steam? And uh, the footage that you've been looking at is from Rule the Waves 2. It's from a succession series I did with Tortuga Power uh, and uh, Ben Magnus and a few other folks. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, I included a couple of screenshots from the development catalog. But generally, the footage you're looking at is from Rule the Waves 2. I'm also curious to see how aircraft are adjusted if at all in the up in in roll the waves three because while i think roll the waves does a great job for 1900 to 1925 ish i do think that the air combat leaves something to be desired the way that you know aircraft kind of roam around the map uh, could certainly be better uh, and if you're going to be going into the missile era that might get worse if aircraft get more complex. On the flip side, pushing forward to like 1890 makes sense, and I think the game will support that really well. So I think the front end of the game is rock solid and will remain rock solid with this new expansion. Uh, but I'm curious about the back end, like what work they're doing there to make improvements on, on that and also the battle generator. But that's enough of me rambling. Really curious about your guys' thoughts. I'm excited. Uh, but we'll we'll see how this uh, unfolds until next time this is the historical gamer as always saying thank you very much for watching and until next time i'm out